Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the webinar organized by the European Reference Kidney Network, coordinated by Professor Franz Schaefer from Heidelberg. The topic of today is microscopic hematuria uh, and will be presented by Dr. Rachel Lennon from Manchester, UK. My name is Elena Levchenko. I'm a pediatric nephrologist from Belgium and I will moderate this webinar out of my office in Leuven. During the webinar, the slides will be projected on your screen and you will be able to send us your questions using the special tab on your attendee panel. Questions can be sent anytime during the presentation and will be answered at the end of the webinar. Uh, today we will have also some questions for you, which will be presented at the end of the webinar. So please pay good attention so that you will be able to answer all questions. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and the slides will be published at the website of um, ERCnet. Let me now introduce um, our speaker of today, Dr. Rachel Lennon uh, from Manchester, UK. Rachel Lennon graduated from Nottingham University Medical School in 1994. She trained in clinical pediatrics in Nottingham, London, and the southwest of England, and she completed her specialty training in pediatric nephrology in Bristol. She was awarded a Wellcome Trust Research Training Fellowship in 2004 to train in Peter Madison and Moen Salim's laboratory where she completed her PhD studying circulating mediators of kidney disease. Rachel was appointed to a uh, National Institute of Health Research Academic Clinical Lectureship in 2007. And uh, in 2008, she began working in Martin Humphreys Laboratory at the Wellcome Trust Center for Cell Metrics Research in Manchester. In 2010, she was awarded again with the Wellcome Trust Intermediate Clinical Fellowship to establish her own research group. Rachel's research is focused on understanding mechanisms of glomerular disease, which is a leading cause of chronic kidney disease in adults and children. Her research questions concerns how the glomerular filtration barrier or kidney filter is regulated in health and disrupted in disease. During the intermediate fellowship, Rachel's group developed methods to apply discovery proteomics to investigate the composition and assembly of metrics in the kidney filters. In 2016, Rachel was awarded a Wellcome Trust Senior Research Fellowship in Clinical Science, and over the next five years, her work will focus on the molecular regulation of force in the kidney filter. Uh, Rachel combines her academic work with clinical duties as a consultant pediatric nephrologist at the Royal Manchester Clinical Hospital. She is an excellent lecturer and she was awarded very recently with Michelle Wynn and her lectureship during the last um, uh, American Society of Nephrology meeting in San Diego. Uh, so Rachel, the floor is yours now. We are all very much eager to hear your talk, please. Lovely. Thank you, Elena, and thank you for the introduction. I'm delighted to be presenting uh, this, this afternoon's webinar on microscopic hematuria. Um, as a pediatric nephrologist, my focus will be on microscopic hematuria in the pediatric population. And I will also focus on the um, context in the context of persistent microscopic hematuria um, um, with a hereditary um, um, aspect to it. So in the next 25 minutes or so, I will go through the differential diagnosis of microscopic hematuria in children and then focus more on familial causes of hematuria and discuss and introduce you to Alport syndrome. I have um, a case series that we um, investigated in Manchester that will illustrate the phenotypic variation in Alport syndrome. I will then talk about um, the increasing um, finding that we have in the clinic of heterozygous mutations in type 4 collagen and what the clinical significance of this may be. 
and then um, talk briefly about the interventions that we can currently be using for these uh, children in the clinic. And I'll finish up with a summary. So there are many causes of hematuria in children and they're not all listed on this slide. Um, of course, there is macroscopic visible hematuria and microscopic hematuria. And I have just broadly categorized these into glomerular causes and non-glomerular causes here. Um, but as I say, this isn't an exhaustive list. Amongst the glomerular causes, um, glom glomerular nephritis, characterized on biopsy by C3 deposition or IgA disease, and in the pediatric population, this may well present as a multi-system um, disorder with Henoch and Lyme purpura, um, or else we could be looking at a basement membrane glomerulopathy. And as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, this will be the focus, the main focus of my uh, webinar. In terms of non-glomerular causes, again, a long list, um, not exhaustive, um, but the commonest causes here would be um, urinary tract infection. In terms of numbers of individuals, then the literature quotes up to 1% of the general population as having microscopic hematuria. And in up to 50% of, or half of these cases, this may well be um, familial. So when I'm presented with a patient in my clinic who has persistent microscopic hematuria, um, then these are the investigations that I would start by performing. Um, of course, when the patient comes to clinic, we, um, we need to take a thorough history. And I'll go through some of the aspects of the history that are important in the context of microscopic hematuria as I go through the presentation. In terms of examination, then a general examination, um, measurement of blood pressure um, is clearly important in this group. Um, and clearly in terms of growth and looking for signs of renal disease, um, height and weight um, in the children. So then to focus on the investigations, that initial set of investigations from clinic, it's important to know that we can't um, be sure about a diagnosis of microscopic hematuria without urine microscopy. So there are some false positives in urinalysis, dipstick testing, and so it's imperative for us to confirm the presence of red cells by performing urine microscopy. Given the populations that, that I see in, in Manchester in the UK, um, then I would always routinely perform a calcium creatinine ratio on the urine as well. In terms of blood tests, then for hematology, a full blood count and coagulation um, would be initial tests in my screen, as well as biochemistry, including a renal profile. And I, I list the renal profile um, here on the slide in terms of what we um, include in our biochemistry uh, laboratory. To look for evidence of um, glomerular nephritis, then I would um, perform, depending on the history, um, but in most cases I would perform um, uh, an ASO titer to look for evidence of post-infectious, uh, post-streptococcal um, GN, um, complement C3 and C4, and um, anti-nuclear antibodies. Again, depending on the um, context and the history, I'd consider doing a renal ultrasound scan and an x-ray to look at the kidneys, um, ureters and bladder, um, particularly if there is um, a suggestion that the hematuria here may be due to um, a renal stone disease or even due to um, recurrent infections. So this is my initial screen um, of investigations. Um, and if there is nothing from this screen that directs me to a particular uh, um, non-glomerular or glomerular cause, then that's when I consider further investigation with genetic testing. So, and I'll, I'll come back to, to, to that in more detail later. So let's just talk about the glomerular causes of um, hematuria. Um, most of us will have two um, kidneys at birth, and in each of our kidneys, um, as many of this audience I'm sure will know, 
we have about a million nephrons, the individual functioning units of the kidney. And at the proximal end of the nephron, we have the glomerulus. And the wall of the glomerulus is the glomerular filtration barrier. So as this image shows, um, this, this capillary wall is specialized. It's designed to function as a filter. Um, and it's specialized by virtue of having some unique cells. So we've got endothelial cells that line the capillaries, and then we have the specialized podocytes, the epithelial cells that are on the outside of the capillaries. And in between both of these cells is the glomerular basement membrane. So this is the scaffold that enables this structure to form and importantly allows the cells to hold on to and to function as, as, as a filter. So in glomerular disease, this specialized structure is um, affected and you can see the morphological change that takes us from a healthy filter. And this is the corresponding electron micrograph here where you can see the basement membrane, the fit processes of the podocytes, and then the endothelial cells on the inner surface of the capillary. And um, so this very ordered and specialized structure um, under, undergoes a, a number of changes. And one of the commonest changes that we will see almost universally when the kidneys are leaking protein is effacement or flattening of podocyte fit processes. And then depending on the underlying cause of the glomerular disease, we may see changes in the basement membrane. And what I'm illustrating here is some um, expanded regions and um, an abnormal basement membrane. So in terms of that basement membrane, um, then we know um, considerable amount now um, from research over two or three decades about the composition of the of the basement membrane and one of the key components and the key scaffolding proteins in the glomerular basement membrane is type 4 collagen um, and this is a, um, a lovely illustration from Billy Hudson's paper a number of years ago now um, showing the um, network of type 4 collagen and it comes in three varieties. So there is the alpha-1-1-2 network, which is um, found in almost all blood vessels in the body. There's the alpha-3-4-5 network and the alpha-5-5-6 network. And to make these type 4 collagen networks, we need six genes, um, alpha-1 through alpha-6. And so, um, we know with type with with Alport syndrome, it is the three four five network that is affected, and so we will see mutations in either alpha three, alpha four, or alpha five of type four collagen in patients with with Alport syndrome. So, what's the consequence of having an abnormal basement membrane? Well, this is a beautiful image that was published a number of years ago, and it's actually very hard to capture these images under the microscope. But here is a, a capillary wall, um, and you can see an abnormal basement membrane here with some splits and some cellular inclusions here in the basement membrane. Um, but the key feature here is a red cell that's escaping out across um, the capillary wall. Um, and so this is in um, the context of thin basement membranes. Um, and we think here splits occur in the basement membrane, which is where and how red cells manage it, manage to cross um, and are ultimately then detectable in the urine as, as microscopic hematuria. So over the last couple of decades, our understanding of the genetics behind um, microscopic hematuria and particularly um, in inherited causes of microscopic hematuria has improved considerably. Um, top of the list are the genes that are mutated in Alport syndrome and thin basement membrane disease. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the uh, alpha 3, 4 and 5 genes are the ones that are predominantly affected. Um, the alpha 5 and the alpha 6 
uh, genes are on the same chromosome, that's the X chromosome, um, and so some patients will have run-through mutations that also um, affect the alpha-6 gene. Other causes, um, so for thin basement membrane disease, um, this is uh, associated with just having one abnormal gene um, of alpha-3 or alpha-4 or, or in females, um, the alpha-5 gene. As I said, this is on the, carried on the X chromosome. Um, but there are a number of other genes that we know associate with familial microscopic hematuria. And these genes, um, mutations in these genes can phenocopy um, Alport syndrome, um, in particular, um, the rare uh, renal disease, glomerular disease, uh, either known as Epstein, Fechner, or um, uh, Sebastian Mayheglin uh, syndromes, can include a renal phenotype. Um, but the clue here with these gene abnormalities is um, a defect in platelets, so typically uh, macro thrombocytopenia. Uh, rather than mutations in type 4 collagen genes, the mutations here are in um, MYH9, which encodes a non-muscle myosin. Um, there are uh, rare um, uh, mutations in fibronectin 1, uh, causing glomerulopathy with fibronectin deposits. And then, um, I guess more recently, we've um, um, a better understanding of the role of complement um, and complement related genes in terms of familial causes of microscopic hematuria. So many of these genes are now will be included in genetic screening panels um, that are available um, within Europe and, and, and North America for uh, investigating microscopic hematuria. Um, but it's very likely that there are more genes to add on to this list and, um, uh, and, and I'm sure there is more that we will discover with um, uh, the detailed genetic investigations with whole exome and whole genome sequencing that uh, are currently underway. So let me tell you more about Alport syndrome specifically. So this can present with macroscopic, microscopic hematuria. Um, it's a rare kidney disease and depending on the uh, reports, the incidence ranges from 1 in 5,000 to, to 1 in 10,000, but it accounts for up to 2% of um, individuals on, in end-stage uh, renal disease. As I mentioned, the mutations affect type 4 collagen and in particular the alpha 3, 4, 5 uh, network of type 4 collagen. So that can result in an autosomal recessive um, inheritance pattern if patients carry two abnormal copies of the alpha-3 or alpha-4 genes. More commonly, we will see um, mutations in col 4 a 5 which, as I said, is carried on the X chromosome. So here, males will have the more severe phenotype if they have an affected uh, gene and then the heterozygous mutations um, uh, in col 4 a 3 and A4 can cause uh, what we've previously termed thin basement membrane disease. Um, and, oops, I'm just flicking through. Um, and um, I'll come back to, the, to that in a, to this, this um, uh, in a little while, just to talk more about the uh, clinical significance. So having mutations in these genes um, affects our ability to assemble a type 4 collagen network. And if we were to look really early on at the basement membrane, it would be thin initially, but then gradually over time, the basement membrane becomes irregular and has what is called a characteristic basket weave appearance. Um, and this is invariably associated with microscopic hematuria and then the um, development of proteinuria and ultimately a decline in renal function, a decline in GFR. So I've included on this slide um, uh, a light microscopy image, image here demonstrating focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Um, and I'll mention a little bit more about this in a few slides, but um, if we do a biopsy early on in Alport syndrome, then 
light microscopy may well be normal. Um, but there may also be, um, uh, FSGS may also be associated with Alport syndrome. And the point um, here is to make sure that with a new diagnosis of FSGS, um, to make sure that um, ultrastructure in terms of electron microscopy is performed in, in these biopsies so that um, um, we are able to consider whether Alport syndrome is the cause of FSGS in, in, in patients. Um, of course, a combined approach with pathology, histopathology and um, genetic analysis would, would be able to reach the same conclusion. Um, but we are understanding more about patients now, particularly in the context of adults presenting with FSGS, who who um, sec go undergo genetic testing to confirm actually the cause of their FSGS is, is an underlying Alport mutation. Um, I've just put on the bottom of the screen here um, um, the association, um, increasing association that we're seeing with some of the Alport genes. Um, and this one paper that came out just this year um, shows COL4A3 variants associating with diabetic kidney disease. So this is um, perhaps suggestive that if you can abnormal copy, just one abnormal copy of these um, uh, autosomal recessive genes, then perhaps that puts you at more risk of, get it, of developing glomerular disease with a second hit such as um, diabetes. So how do we um, diagnose Alport syndrome? Well, um, this can be based on the clinical presentation with hematuria. Um, important for us to think about family history. So in that initial presentation, um, um, talk about the family history and establish whether is that there's a history of um, chronic kidney disease, um, and deafness. So I've not mentioned so far that as well as affecting um, uh, the kidneys, clearly um, Alport syndrome can affect hearing with sensory neural hearing loss. And there are also ocular defects that are described in um, um, Alport syndrome. And they, they may um, also be evident in, in a careful family history. The kidney biopsy, as I have said, um, can give us clues with that abnormal basement membrane, but it's important that um, the biopsy is examined by um, electron microscopy uh, to, to reach that diagnosis. Um, the eye signs um, are typical um, of Alport syndrome with anterior lenticonus and macular flex on the, uh, in the retina. Um, and then the hearing. So in, in the individual um, patient that comes for a screen considering um, Alport syndrome, um, then I would routinely request ophthalmology and audiology assessment. So I'm now just going to run through um, a case, a family that presented to us in Manchester um, that I think illustrates um, how not all patients behave in the same way and as per the textbooks. So I'll start with um, uh, the first presentation from this family, and this was with um, a two-year-old boy who presented with a fever, um, cola-coloured urine, and went on to have um, a series of investigations. So his creatinine at presentation was normal, and he also had normal immunology, so his complement and his ASO titer were normal. There was a family history of renal disease, and I'll come back to that. Um, but we proceeded without an obvious um, explanation for um, uh, this um, patient's um, presentation. Um, we proceeded to perform a renal biopsy. Um, and um, by electron microscopy, he was um, found to have a variable thickness in his basement membrane. He went on to have normal eye and hearing assessments. And then ultimately we performed genetic analysis and this confirmed that he had an abnormal copy of COL4A5. So carried on the um, X chromosome. So therefore um, enabling us to diagnose X-linked Alport syndrome. 
So this is his, his um, electron microscopy. And what you can see is an irregular basement membrane. So there are patches of um, uh, a change in, echo, in um, electron density in this basement membrane. And, and so there were thickened regions, but also um, some thin regions of the basement membrane at 92 nanometers um, in this section. So variable thickness in the GBM but otherwise relatively well-preserved um, podocyte architecture. So this um, young boy had an older sibling who had presented to us a number of years before. And so um, this got us thinking about the siblings presentation. So um, this eight-year-old um, sibling, um, female, presented to us when the family relocated to the UK from Pakistan. And she was um, close to end stage renal disease when she presented. As such, we didn't proceed uh, to a diagnostic renal biopsy um, that prepared her for dialysis and ultimately um, a deceased donor transplant that she um, had a year later. Um, she has satisfactory graft function at the age of 17. And um, although we didn't perform her genetic analysis at the time, um, in light of her brother's, her younger brother's presentation, we went on to confirm that she also had a heterozygous mutation in COL4A5. This didn't entirely fit with her presentation. So being just having a single abnormal copy of the gene didn't for us really explain her phenotype. Um, in light of the uh, collagen mutation, she went on to have normal um, eye and uh, audiometry examinations. And um, we looked into together with the team, uh, Professor Francis Flinter's team at Guy's Hospital in London, we went on to do some further analysis of um, her genetics. Um, and she did have evidence of skewed X inactivation. So potentially um, explaining why she had a more severe phenotype if the cells in her kidney weren't, uh, were, were predominantly expressing the mutant form of, of the um, COL4A5. But the story continued and there was another sibling that presented, this time a five-year-old male, um, um, within the family, and this was a, um, all within the space of a few years that these um, children presented to us. Uh, so he presented with fever and elevated creatinine, and he had persistent microscopic hematuria and proteinuria after this acute illness had settled down. So he had some evidence of acute kidney injury in association with a fever, um, but then weeks and months later, he had persistent microscopic hematuria and proteinuria. Now, by this time, um, though, we had a more of a, an awareness about um, other affected siblings, and we and so we elected not to perform a renal biopsy because of uh, knowing the family history. But we did go on to confirm a genetic, the same genetic mutation in COL4A5 um, because of the persistent proteinuria in this patient we started treatment with um, an ACE inhibitor. So he started on treatment with an allopril. And then the final sibling in this family um, presented um, more, most recently, and interestingly presented at the age of six months um, with nephrotic syndrome. So facial swelling, macroscopic hematuria, and already given his age and the presence of macroscopic hematuria, um, he is presenting with atypical features of nephrotic syndrome. Um, we did a couple of things in terms of treatment at the time. Um, in terms of controlling his nephrosis and, um, uh, um, and significant edema, he went on to have therapy with 20% albumin replacement daily. Um, and we also gave him a trial of steroids. Um, he went on to have a renal biopsy and this confirmed both basement membrane defects as well as abnormalities um, in, in his podocytes. So the podocytes were effaced. The steroids didn't have 
um, any effect in on his proteinuria, and so he went on to um, ACE inhibition. And unfortunately, his function declined fairly rapidly over the next few years, and he commenced peritoneal dialysis at the age of three years. He also carried um, uh, the familial mutation on um, COL4A5. But we didn't think this, um, again, was sufficient an explanation um, for his phenotype. So we went on then to perform um, whole exome sequencing and identified a mutation in myosin 1E. Um, so this is a gene that's been associated with FSGS um, and therefore perhaps now gives us some explanation in this family why there is this phenotypic variability. So here's the family pedigree uh, where we found um, a family history um, um, in grandparents with um, renal failure and then affected um, siblings uh, within this family that I've described. And you can see just in the red circles um, uh, the um, mycin 1E um, gene changes. So some of the children affected by that, namely the youngest sibling with the nephrotic syndrome and the older female who presented in end stage. Um, and then we can see where um, the other family members are affected by the collagen gene mutation as well. So this is a fairly complex case, but I think really illustrates how the genetics can help us to understand some of this phenotypic variation. We looked at how some of these proteins could interplay in terms of common pathways, and indeed there is a connection um, between type 4 collagen and the myosin 1E um, when we think about protein-protein um, interaction. So, um, um, this requires further investigation, um, but perhaps tells us that some of these mutations may well augment the phenotype by virtue of the, the, the biological pathways through, through which they act. So what about genetic testing? Um, well, in the UK, um, with persistent microscopic hematuria, we would um, move on to um, a next generation sequencing focused renal gene panel. Um, and this is a gene test that's available um, to us through the NHS um, um, at um, Guy's and Thomas's Hospital in um, London. In terms of um, new mutations without a family history, then this can be up to 15%. Um, but I think there are lots of advantages of screening um, children with microscopic hematuria that, where we don't have an obvious cause and where we're thinking about genetic uh, causes because this gives us a, an early diagnosis. It helps us to think about the mode of inheritance. Um, it enables us to register patients on, on relevant uh, registries and the genetics can um, help us to avoid kidney biopsy. I just briefly want to mention the COL4A3A4 heterozygous mutations and there have been now a series of papers associating um, mutations in just single, uh, so a single copy of the gene affected but associating with um, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis um, and this is um, in, in um, predominantly in adult populations um, but there is most definitely this, this increasing association that we're seeing with um, COL4A3 and A4 mutations and um, thin basement membrane and the risk of, of FSGS. So um, if we're thinking about microscopic hematuria, it may well be affecting up to 1% of the population. Um, having a, a single change is a heterozygous mutation in cold 4A3 and A4 in the studies that are available to us currently would suggest that there is up to a 30% lifetime risk of renal failure um, in these groups but it um, has to be said that so far these studies have looked at those individuals who do develop renal failure and, um, and, and how many of these have uh, the genetic changes so there is an ascertainment bias 
um, uh, in the study so far in that we're focusing on those that have developed renal failure. Um, so this, this risk may well um, uh, be much lower. I've mentioned the family that we, we investigated in Manchester and the effect of other genes that may well be affecting the phenotype, so genetic modifiers um, uh, may well play a role in terms of the progression of kidney disease in individuals carrying a single gene mutation. Um, and of course the role of um, environment in particular, um, hypertension is important to think about in, in these individuals. I think for me what is important when we identify um, uh, a mutation in a heterozygous mutation in collagen 4 genes, um, then this should raise a red flag as this individual is, is likely to be at risk of um, future kidney disease. And I would at this point recommend lifelong renal surveillance with annual, at least annual measurements of urinalysis, blood pressure um, and renal function um, as necessary. So what can we do about these individuals? Um, well, um, we, we have some um, registry studies that show there is intervention that we can be using in the clinic that does make a difference. Um, and this study from Oliver Gross's um, that was led by Oliver Gross um, shows that if we look at um, patients with Alport syndrome that are started on um, early angiotensin converting enzyme inhibition, um, so the earlier therapy is, is, is the hashed line here, and their age of onset of renal replacement therapy is much later by comparison to those that start late. And actually the average um, increase in renal survival um, is, is 10 years or, or more. Um, this, is, this is onset of renal replacement therapy, but what was also found in this study was patient survival. And so you can see that um, use of angiotensin converting enzyme ACE inhibition um, prolongs patient survival. So that's, that's an important study. So in terms of current recommendation, um, I would direct you to um, uh, this publication, um, Expert Guidance for the Management of Alport Syndrome and Thin Basement Membrane Nephropathy, uh, reported a few years ago. Um, and, um, and this gives recommendations for um, early uh, for, for the use of ACE inhibition in patients with persistent proteinuria. We are in a fortunate position currently with new agents coming through into clinical trials and, um, and there are two active clinical trials currently in Alport syndrome, uh, one with an anti-MIR um, uh, uh, which is um, targeting fibrosis pathways um, and this um, is um, um, currently recruiting. Um, there is another trial of bardoxolone. Um, it's, it's not clear how this agent might be working in Alport syndrome and you may be interested to read a perspective article that I wrote together with Colin Bagent um, earlier this year and I'm sure there are future trials um, uh, ahead for us to consider in this patient group. So, in summary, I hope I've given you um, a good overview of microscopic hematuria with a particular focus on children and persistent microscopic hematuria and um, uh, persistent, persistent familial microscopic hematuria. Um, it's important for us not to think of this as a benign condition, but to investigate until we're happy that we have an explanation. Um, and I have hopefully highlighted the importance of genetic testing. What, on confirmation of abnormal um, uh, genetic testing, we have the opportunity to register patients and in terms of gathering prospective data, um, registry resources are invaluable. Um, once we have diagnosed a genetic abnormality in patients, then I would be recommending lifelong surveillance with uh, annual blood pressure and urinalysis and the use of um, um, RAS inhibitors for persistent proteinuria in this group. Thank you. So that's the end of my seminar. I'd be very happy to uh, respond to any questions. And I'll just leave actually the, the final slide, uh, which is... Um, 
Uh, let me just whiz through. So, um, should, um, Elena, should I move on to the questions now? Well, I don't know whether you would like to uh, to, to to ask uh, the audience a question. So I think we still have time. So we can, we have to finish by five o'clock, and uh, so five received two questions. So I think uh, there is some time to ask the audience the questions if you want. Okay. So um, yeah. So I've I've got a, it's a range of questions here that just will come from different parts of the presentation. Let's uh, um, start with the, the first question. Um, so hopefully you will be able to see. Um, so the first question from today's presentation. So what's the commonest cause of hematuria in children? And you have four choices. OK. <clears throat> Okay, so we've got still, we've got, I can still see people are voting. Okay, well, I think we're no, still going. Okay, I'll close the poll there. Um, and let me share those results. Okay, so yeah, so in terms of the options that you have there, then the correct answer is urinary tract infection in terms of the commonest cause of, um, I didn't specify microscopic or macroscopic hematuria, but it's um, clearly the clinical context there will um, give us some clues. Um, and then um, um, otherwise um, post-infectious glomerulonephritis I think would come second followed by um, HSP and then Alport syndrome as a rare uh, cause. Okay, so the next question, okay, hide results and then, now this is now going into Alport syndrome specifically, so what is the commonest mode of inheritance in Alport syndrome? Okay, let's see what you had to say. Excellent, yeah. So uh, around 80% is what we currently think in terms of uh, the mode of inheritance, both the um, COL4A5 and A6 gene um, are on the X chromosome, and it's most commonly the COL4A5 gene uh, that is affected. If there is a run-through mutation that affects um, both COL4A5 and A6, then this can be associated with a rare phenotype where um, patients may develop uh, lyomyomyomas. Um, so these are smooth muscle tumors um, uh, that which can be rarely associated with, with Alport syndrome. Okay, let's get on to the next question. So, um, what about treatment? So, what treatment is recommended for an eight-year-old boy with Alport syndrome and persistent proteinuria? Okay, let's see what you thought about that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, no question. Okay, great. And finally, just in terms of um, genetics, I think um, just mutations in the following genes cause Alport syndrome. 
Okay, let's see what you thought about that one. Yep, yeah, so call four, A3, four and five. I can see that um, some of you have voted for the call for A6. So call for A6 may be involved, but it would always be with a call for A5 mutation. And the, the reason why this answer isn't um, correct is because the call for A2 and A1 genes um, are not affected in Alport syndrome. So um, type 4 collagen in basement membranes um, forms as an alpha 112 network, a 345 network, which is affected in Alport syndrome, or a 556 network. Um, um, which can also be affected in Alport syndrome, but um, it is the three, four, and five genes that are, are causative. Great, okay. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. I think a lot of people learned things because you had a very good score at the end of the lecture. So yeah. we have some people who just thank you for your excellent lecture. And um, we have also a few questions. So the first question uh, was whether um, food process, photocyte food process effacement can help to distinguish between uh, um, FSGS or primary FSGS and FSGS due to Alport syndrome. Yeah, so just on the basis of podocyte um, abnormalities on a biopsy, then um, podocyte foot process um, effacement is common and we would see that in all glomerular diseases, almost all glomerular diseases where there is persistent proteinuria, you would see some regions uh, around the capillaries with podocyte foot process effacement. So by itself, um, that doesn't help us distinguish between different causes of FSGS. Um, um, whereas the basement membrane is, is what we need to focus on if we're looking for um, Alport syndrome changes. So, um, so um, you, you can get basement membrane changes associated with other glomerular diseases, but looking for that um, very irregular split basket weave appearance of the basement membrane is, is the clue with um, Alport syndrome as a cause of um, FSGS. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question from Marina Shomikina in Russia. Uh, she asks about the nutcracker syndrome as a cause of hematuria. Uh, um, so she asks, what do you think about nutcracker syndrome as a cause of hematuria and uh, maybe how to, uh, to, um, to diagnose it? Yeah, so it's not something that I've, I've focused on. I've personally not seen a case in my clinical practice. So in terms of its frequency, um, it's either um, undiagnosed in my own practice or, um, or, or incredibly rare. Um, Elena, I don't know whether you've had particular experience of nutcracker syndrome. Well, um, I have seen, um, I think, uh, maybe two patients in total, but uh, these patients really had low in pain, so the, the hematuria, it was a, a, a macroscopic hematuria associated with flank pain, eh? and, uh, and the pain is relieved when the patient's uh, patient lies on his abdomen uh, because it decreases the, the pressure um, on the renal vein, and, uh, and it's a... Uh, 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 it's a very characteristic sign. So, but um, nutcracker syndrome as a cause of um, microscopic hematuria, I have not seen these patients, although they are described. They are described in the literature, but I guess it is very, very rare. Yeah. Um, so we have a few other questions. Um, um, what is there, uh, from genetic point of view, is there a difference between Alport syndrome and syn basement membrane? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. So for um, this is gene dosage. Um, I think in terms of the the answer. So um, if um, in terms of autosomal recessive Alport syndrome, if there are two abnormal copies of the gene, so col four A three, um, two abnormal copies of col four A three or col four A four, or even one of each, um, then that the, the um, uh, 
the phenotype will be more severe. Um, and uh, thinking about the X-linked um, Alport gene, COL4A5, um, then this is also a gene dosage effect. So females um, will typically have an abnormal um, copy of the gene and their phenotype will be less severe. And if you were to look at um, the um, biopsies or the, the, the basement membranes in, um, in, in heterozygous mutations, so the, the um, COL3A4 or A, 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 A3 or A4, and then the female um, COL4A5, then those basement membranes would be um, thin, and um, they may well progress over time to, to have more of the features that we see with Alport syndrome. Um, but um, there is um, there is still a, a normal copy of the gene in those individuals that just carry one abnormal gene. And so we associate that more with thin basement membranes initially, um, and with Alport syndrome, the more abnormal basement membranes um, because they have more of uh, essentially we think they are a they are less able to um, to synthesize and assemble that important type 4 collagen network in the basement membrane okay thank you so we have a couple of questions uh, so there is um, a dr. Lily from China and there are several people asking the same whether genetic testing should be performed in all children presenting with microscopic hematuria only but no proteinuria no uh, kidney function disturbances no family history yeah so this is a, a really important question um, and um, in Manchester we have made the decision that we will perform um, genetic testing on children when we don't have a, an explanation for persistent microscopic hematuria. So if we work through the series of investigations that I described and we don't have an explanation, um, then we first of all look into other family members to see whether this is familial, whether their parents have microscopic hematuria as well. Um, this would um, certainly direct us to performing genetic investigation, but we know that some children may have de novo mutations. So up to 15% of these mutations, these heterozygous mutations could be there for the first time. So if we don't have an explanation for persistent microscopic hematuria beyond six months, um, then we would go on to perform um, the focus gene panel that I mentioned. Okay, and you would perform the focus the gene panel and not a uh, kidney biopsy. So the genetic testing will be your first uh, diagnostic test. Yes, it would be. Okay, so there are also a couple of people who are asking the same question and it concerns the early start of um, ACE inhibitors or RAS blockage before the onset of proteinuria or at really early stages of Alport syndrome or uh, uh, at the diagnosis. So would you recommend to start uh, this sort of drugs in uh, patients at the very early, early stages of the disease? And if so, when would you recommend? Yeah, so this is with persistent um, proteinuria. The current guidance um, um, that we have for Alport syndrome is with um, persistent proteinuria. There is a clinical trial um, led uh, by um, Oliver Gross in Germany, um, looking at the looking to ask the question whether in um, patients with Alport syndrome. So, for example, boys with uh, a mutation in COL4A5, whether in fact there is advantage of starting ACE inhibition at the point um, of, of, of microscopic hematuria before um, the onset of proteinuria. And this trial is currently recruiting. It's the early protect trial. And we're expecting to see results of this trial um, in the early part of 2019. So I think that's an important question. Um, so far, the, the data that I, I presented in the presentation today suggests that if that, that early therapy um, is protective, um, but we don't yet know whether it's safe 
to bring that as early as uh, um, initial presentation in very small children with microscopic hematuria. But, but the trial, the early PROTECT trial, um, will help us understand whether that's um, um, uh, safe to do. Okay, so I think we have uh, just one uh, last question. And actually, it's a combination of two questions that concerning the diagnosis. So uh, there is one question regarding the cutoff value of red blood cells. And um, so this person asks whether when you have a very low grade of uh, um, hematuria, like uh, 5 to 10 uh, red blood cells uh, per high power field, uh, whether uh, you would consider um, it persistent if it is uh, really uh, like uh, persistent after four to six months. And another question is whether there uh, morphology of red blood cells and the amount of acanthocytes and their uh, so this person asked, what is the amount which would uh, uh, lead you to the diagnosis of glomerular hematuria? So two questions about the diagnosis of glomerular hematuria. What yeah. is the cutoff value and uh, about the morphology and acanthocytes? Yeah, yeah. So in terms of the cutoff, then I would consider as low as five to ten uh, per high power field, um, high power field to be significant and. Um, proceed in the same way uh, with um, investigations, as I discussed, including the genetics. Um, and then in terms of the morphology, um, then uh, by making the um, by looking at um, the, the red cells, um, we can get an indication of whether they have been um, altered in terms of morphology as they uh, as they squeezed through glomerular capillaries, so if they are if they are distorted uh, versus um, intact um, red blood cells under my under the microscope, um, then that can give us an indication of whether this is higher up in the glomerulus, as with um, uh, uh, the glomerular glomerular diseases, or lower down if the red blood cells are intact. Um, this perhaps would be more in keeping with uh, a source um, lower down in the urinary tract, in the bladder, in the urethra, um, and so it may well direct us more to a urological cause um, of the microscopic hematuria and 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 direct investigations um, uh, in a different in a different path. Um, so yeah, I think the morphology can help. Um, uh, and and yeah, in in terms of that cutoff, then I would still accept the low five to ten cutoff. Um, it is um, possible to um, in some samples, particularly if they've been stored um, uh, inappropriately before getting to the laboratory, you may well miss the microscopic hematuria on single samples. So sending multiple samples, um, um, if there's a high level of suspicion. Um, is is one way around that. Um, Rachel, we have a lot of questions. I think I just do the, the last one and then we are going to stop and I'm very sorry for those whose questions are not uh, answered uh, because we have not uh, much time until five o'clock. But uh, the last category of questions is about the biopsy. And the first one is whether you would consider, still consider kidney biopsy in a child with microscopic hematuria when um, genetic testing doesn't reveal any mutations. And the second question is um, whether you are still performing skin biopsy uh, to um, uh, in, in these patients and whether there is still place in skin biopsy. And after that, we are going to close. So uh, uh, once again, I apologize for those whose questions are not answered. Yeah, so I think genetics has really transformed our investigation of these patients. And um, if, um, uh, if, if this is positive, then we, we can avoid the kidney biopsy. Um, but um, it is possible, we, we we are still discovering um, new mutations in the in the Alport genes, and so um, when um, variants on these genes are um, identified in the genetic laboratories, um, they will be assigned a certain level of significance, and it may well be that variants um, do not. Uh, um, associate with um, pathology um, at, at a, a point in time when 
when we're when we're doing the genetic testing. Um, so we have had one or two patients in Manchester where we've had a high level of suspicion and the mm -hmm. genetic been negative. Um, and um, but I think if there are um, other uh, pointers in the history. So, for example, if there is a hearing loss in a male patient or so with um, uh, microscopic hematuria, then I think in those situations I would proceed to do uh, renal biopsy and, um, and and examine the basement membranes. Um, in terms of skin biopsies, uh, we, we haven't um, included those in our clinical practice. I know that's that's more commonplace in other parts of the world. Um, but if we were to to perform a biopsy um, for a tissue diagnosis, then in, in Manchester we would we would do a kidney biopsy. Okay, thank you very much for the brilliant lecture uh, and uh, the audience for your very very active discussion. The webinar is closed. Thank you very much. <laughs>